Welcome, Guy. The tables have turned, and now I'm interviewing you instead of you interviewing the hundreds of people you've already interviewed. So I'm gonna. I want to get some insights into your experience, and I want to start off by having you explain, introduce yourself to us, who you are and a little bit about your background and current role before we talk about these videos you've been doing. All right, well, thank you, Gary DePaul, for uh, flipping the tables here on me. My name is Guy Wallace, and I am a semi-retired uh, instructional systems design consultant. I've been consulting since 1982. I entered the field back in 1979. Um, I was greatly influenced by people who were greatly influenced by the work of Gary A. Rumler, the late Gary A. Rumler, and Tom Gilbert, the late uh, Tom Gilbert, and the late Joe Harless, and the very much alive Bob Mager. Those were some of my biggest influences. Um, but I've spent the last 10 years, I've done uh, several curriculum architecture design projects. That's the thing I've kind of been known for uh, throughout my career. And, but I also spent 20 months in Toronto uh, trying to clean up a uh, messy situation with uh, SOPs, uh, standing, standard operating procedures, and then followed up with another project spending uh, months at, with another pharma company doing the same thing. Our client had moved from one pharma company in Canada to another company in, in the States, and so we kind of followed him and, and did that same kind of work. Um, but most of my work over the past 40 years is instruction, so the curriculum architecture design thing where I do training and development paths and planning guides, all based on a model of performance that's used to systematically derive all the enabling knowledge and skills and then you take all the performance data and the knowledge and skill data and look for existing content within a company so that you can affect reuse um, and reuse as is or reuse after modification because you may need to bookend some content with here's what this is all about and how we're going to apply it in your world and then go off and learn the generic content and then a bookend at uh, the back end, which is uh, applications, uh, practice, and feedback, so that you can uh, try to affect transfer, and then hopefully, if you targeted this in the right in the first place, there'll be return on investment. Okay, listen to this. Since 2008, you've interviewed several professionals as part of your HPT video series. Would you share how you came up with the idea and what the heck this HPT means? and describe how your project has evolved. Well, HPT, Human Performance Technology, is the where the word technology means the application of science. So this is all about the science of performance improvement. Um, and it's uh, all performance is a human endeavor, the late Don Toasty once said and that struck me so yes we have bulldozers but we've got them so that we can eliminate human labor and bulldozers can do the work of uh, lots of different people but uh, anyway so um, that so HPT and the term is also known as HPI human performance improvement or evidence-based practices for performance improvement PI many performance technology many different things and my professional home which was NSPI and is now ISPI, has struggled with marketing the concept of human performance technology. People say, oh, technology, that means computers, and that's not what we mean. Well, we've done a poor job of marketing what it does mean, and so back in 2008, I decided I was going to do some guerrilla marketing uh, for the concept of human performance technology, uh, kind of with or without uh, ISPI. So I conceived of this uh, concept where people would make a bunch of videos following a general script so there'd be some similarity to what, what you might hear from all the people that were involved in this thing. And I convinced ISPI to make a contest out of this and with prizes so that the best video, and I decided you know I wouldn't be included in this, and I started making a bunch of these videos. And I wanted to encourage others to make them as well. Well, I think four other people made them for that first conference in 2008, and then ISBI had no desire to try it again for 2009. But again, we had done poor marketing of the whole concept of doing this video series. 
So anyway, I had done these videos, and in particular that first year, I asked uh, my one of my key mentors, the late Gary Rumler, if he would do one of these things with me. And I said, here's my script. And he said, oh, okay, well, give me that script, and I'm not going to do this right now, but I'm going to, I'll do it tomorrow. So tomorrow at a certain time, and so we made that arrangement. Well, he had spent the night writing out his answers to these questions so that he wouldn't miss anybody. And we did the video, and it was a short video, and it was, I think, like eight minutes or something. And I said, you know, I really would like to interview for a couple hours. Could I have a couple hours of your time to do one of these? And I said, probably at the next conference. So, And he said, yes, he would do that. Now, I was so excited about that. I was going to have this great interview with Gary Rumler. But then we lost him in between those mm -hmm. two conferences, and so I didn't get to do that. Well, that even encouraged me further to not just get a bunch of the uh, newer people to the field, younger people to the field, but get a bunch of the old guard before they're no longer with us. And so I conceived not only of having this HPT practitioner series where I hung a laminated set of questions on the front of my camera and they just spoke into the camera answering those questions and that was it, just them and the camera. And uh, I decided that I wanted to ask extended questions of some of the old guard people who have been around for a long time. And so then I was going to have to be part of the process, part of the interview. You were going to hear my voice asking these same standard questions, but then allowing me to probe uh, some of the answers and go a little bit further and try to capture who these people people are. So I've said it's the, I wanted to capture the diversity of HPT practitioners and their practices because HPT is an umbrella concept or term and it's inclusive of people who do training, instruction, learning kinds of things, knowledge management kinds of things, uh, doing hiring and firing, do organization design, job design, process re-engineering, uh, Six Sigma Lean, um, there's a, a, all sorts of incentive and motivational kinds of things, um, just management in general, measurement of, of business results, and all of that. Uh, to me, all of that falls under the umbrella of human performance technology. So in the series, I've interviewed some Six Sigma practitioners, some Baldridge examiners. Um, I've got a couple of those people scheduled to do this. So... So far to date, I've got 108 videos, mm -hmm. and today we're doing two, so this will hit 110. So my goal is to shoot for something <clears throat> in the neighborhood of 200 to 250, and then I'll probably take a break. I would have hoped that others would have picked up on doing something like this and done them in parallel with me, but th that did not happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this has become my way of kind of giving back. Again, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll attribute this uh, part of my fire and desire to do all of this it was to, for Gary Rumler. In 99, I had written a book and I had asked him to review it and he was very gracious and did a fairly thorough review of it. I'm not sure he read every last word, but he knew it from front to end. And uh, he decided he, I should change the title of the book and I should change the cover art. And he redid all of that for me and then presented it to me with his feedback. And I, so the book took a new name and a new cover look and style and feel. But I would asked him after that, I said, you know, so how can I ever repay you? Um, for all that you've done for me, because he's been a mentor, I worked with him at Motor when I was at Motorola. He was my consultant, and I carried his pencils around as we went from clients uh, site to site to site and, and did the Gary Rumler work. Um, but I had learned so much from him, and he'd been so kind and generous to me over the years. And, you know, how could I ever repay him? And he said, you can't. <laughs> You're going to have to do what I did. I, I, I had to repay my mentors by paying it forward guy. And so... I always think of that uh, paying it forward is what he said I was going to have to do to pay him back. So uh, I often ask when I've helped somebody else, I make a point of telling them that little story and saying, okay, you need to pay it forward yourself. And it's so true that in our field, um, the people are so open and approachable. 
uh, even those people who are gruff and unapproachable are really approachable because they can't help themselves but sh give it up when you ask them about what they do because they, they love it so much. Well, one of the things about these videos, you have some standard questions that you ask that kind of guides and develop some, um, some things with what you're trying to get at. And I'd like to ask you some questions about your observations. One of the first things you ask interviewees uh, is their first exposure to HPT. What themes have you picked up on when they talk about their first exposure? Well, some names do come up, but it's it you know so a hundred and you know six or excuse me a hundred and eight videos and there's a wide variety of where people got exposed to this. So I think the majority of this is people saying, "I accidentally found yeah. this. I was doing my job and looking for help, and I found this NSPI or ISPI kind of thing or these people, and then I read uh, uh, Bob Mager and Peter Pipe's book, Analyzing Performance Problems, or You Really Ought to Want to. And uh, that just was not, you know, and I can relate to that book because that was the one of the first books that, I, it was the first book that I read when I'd left college and started a new job in a training organization, and that was part of what uh, we wanted to focus on performance and not just training content. Mm. So if there were, if we could find out there's something that training's not going to address or solve or fix, then we shouldn't do it. And so I was, I was so excited when I first read that book. I read that book cover to cover uh, the night I was given it. And the next day I went and bought four additional copies and sent them to my best friends from college. We'd all just recently separated. And I sent them these things in you know, 1979, so it was the U.S. mail. And they sent me letters back that I opened and that said, what the heck is this book? What is this crap? You know, and I'm, they, they didn't get it. But anyway, so uh, so I love that. So the so the themes that of of were how people got exposed to this usually comes down to no names like Rumler and Mager and Harless, uh, sometimes Gilbert, but not initially. I think he's a hard read and uh, hard to get into. But um, so a lot of people talk about uh, being exposed to people like that at conferences, whether it was ASTD back in the day or NSPI back in those days as well, or Lakewood conferences with training, which was associated with Training Magazine. But that's where you'd find the same people, the Judy Hale speaking, the mm. Tiagi speaking, the Harold Stolovich is speaking, and they would all be talking about this stuff and performance improvement and beyond training and... Um, um, but so I think that that it, accidentally people finding their way into this and then making a career out of it. So I, that's that was one of the ahas about what the series has gotten. But but in general, it's a kind of a blur. Mm. You know, I've done maybe ten of these in the last two three weeks, and I remember oh somebody said something really cool, but I can't remember what it was. And should I go back and take excerpts out of all these videos? But it's a lot of work, so I doubt if I'll do that. That is that would be a lot of work uh, with the hundred and eight that you've done so far, and the number continues to grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You also ask people w to share their 30-second um, um, elevator speech. Have you picked up any themes from that That when people talk about what they do? Well, uh, so the, the number one thing that I picked up from that is that nobody can get it done in 30 seconds. Or <laughs> only a few. Maybe out of 108 people, maybe... 10 to 20 got it done in 30 seconds mm. so most people and it's funny because i do the same thing too so it's hard to come up with a short and sweet standard answer with an elevator speech i think and so what what some people have said is that well i, I don't have a standard one but basically i it, it if i give one out it's fresh it's derived off of this standard spiel that i have so you know, I do performance analysis and instructional architecture where I'm trying to modularize content so that it can be just the right amount in just the right time, deliver just the right uh, medium and mode. Um, 
but it depends on who I'm talking to. If I was yeah. at a neighborhood party and a neighbor came up, I might say, well, I'm in the training business and let it go with yeah. that. And if it's somebody uh, at a conference who's in the biz, then you need to give them a little bit of a better answer. But um, I so think you tailor them to your audience. You have to tailor them to your audience, and you have to, you know, you have to decide whether this is a one-floor elevator ride or where are we going up 90 floors, and I've got some time to kill. And who is this, and how? How can I interest them in this? What's the hook? Mm. So if I know them, you know, I would answer some other way. Uh, I might suggest, oh, you might have a problem if they were in sales, you might have a problem with such and such. Hoping that there's a hook that's something that resonates and they go, oh, not this company, but in the last company. You know. So if, there, if there's some way to hook them with something that's real to them, something that's authentic to them, something that's of value to them to solve. So it could be small potatoes and they don't really care, but if it's something that can have a major impact uh, maybe on other things or the thing itself. Um, so you're always tr tailoring it based on what you know about that person. Yeah. So sometimes the uh, the appropriate uh, response is, uh, not much, what do you do? <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> so you can find out what they do first, and then you can say, well, what I really do, and s somehow you can maybe relate it to them. Well, um, I think you just shared a thing that you've run across that with with people in the field, they don't give cookie cutter answers. They really focus on their audience and what their needs are. So that really that seems to capture how how you view elevator speeches and what you've heard from people. Mm -hmm. Can you share some of the favorite performance uh, terms that interviewees have shared with you over the years. So I read your question about that and I thought, oh, I can't, it's really a blur. Um, I can think of maybe some of the terms, but not um, how they define them. Oh, sure. But I, what I found of interest in, in that is that some people have hot buttons and it's the misuse of the word engagement you know and, and then so they've got something to say about that and that's what i want them to do i want them to put their spin on this because i if the series of videos is really for new people new people need to be made aware of uh warned about our jargon and language and not only do we have a unique set of jargon compared to the people that do something other than what we do instructional design kinds of work performance support kinds of work other performance engineering kinds of work we, we have our own language but the real issue is, is that we don't have a common and consistent language so we have 14 names for the same thing <laughs> and true. we have the and we and and we can, you can flip that and then we have one name that can mean fourteen different things and so it's just a it, we we're just we're opportunity rich in cleaning up our language but I take some comfort in knowing that the late Joe Harless complained about this back in 1985 in a, in a NSPI journal article and uh, we're still opportunity rich in that we. We have this language issue, but there's so many new people coming into the field. Uh, one of my interviewees said this uh, a couple weeks ago. There's so many new people coming in that they don't have a history, so they pick up a lot of the new words, jargon, buzzwords, and think that's new and unique and don't know the history of it. And while that's okay that we have new language you know i as an old uh schooler myself i would have stuck to some of the older terms and you know mm. uh research-based became evidence-based practices you know so what happened to research-based you know when yeah. you know when did that get lost and uh but it's so the same kinds of things and so that just makes it more confusing for new people coming in because they hear these terms and it sounds like they're overlapping and are there nuanced differences between them? Um, and so there's there's not much that we can do about that. Well, you know, not no one of us, no group of us is going to be able to ever change that. Um, <clears throat> but... Uh, so in giving thought to the, the terminology and all that, so my favorite two terms, one, the first one is performance-based. 
Now yeah. that can be changed to be lots of different things here, but to me, my my analysis, design, development, work, and all that stuff was performance based, performance centered, performance oriented. It was all about the performance, and it was more than just task analysis because tasks are performed to produce a worthy output. To borrow Tom Gilbert's phrase, worthy output, and so we need to understand the tasks and the outputs and the measurement of what constitutes good versus bad and we need to understand what the feedback mechanisms are and whether they're timely or whether that needs to be re-engineered. Um, we need to look beyond task analysis and because part of what we need to instruct or teach a new person entering into a new job is the whole context and maybe they'll spend most of their time in one corner of the room, so to speak, but there's these other corners you may have to visit, and some of them, uh, you know, there's no telling when it'll happen, if it'll ever happen, but when it does, you have to be competent when you go off to do that. So, um, so we need to have this ability to do, take these holistic looks, and so the performance-based phrase does it for me. It's always worked. And the other one is a, is a term that I got from uh, Jim... Uh, uh, McCampbell of the Chicagoland area and uh, he's I don't know what he's doing if he's still alive or not but anyway he had a big influence on me measured results so he always talked about measured results and so that was a phrase I could use with my clients and talk about well what are their measured results how are you measured what do you get a monthly quarterly report or and so those are your measures okay good let's start with that so this project that you want to talk about and do which of those measures is it going to affect and how soon would it be? Is there going to be like a 90-day lag between us doing something and it showing up? Or when will it show up? And we can have those kinds of conversations and talk about what's the baseline data for those measures. Uh, what's the trend been? So that we can decide whether or not our the gap that we find in the interventions that we might uh, suggest, whether that's going to actually track back to those initial business metrics or whether it's actually going to change something else. So we've, we've got to be aware of it so that we don't mispromise or overpromise the client what metrics we're going to change. Um, but we have to start with something. We have to under, yeah. uh, take what they say and then investigate it to prove it in or prove it out uh, as not being correct. And then we'll have new issues to deal with as we go forward uh, because we're managing now client expectations and that. But so, but measured results was a key phrase for me and it's just because it's uh, everything that's good should be you know measured otherwise yeah. if it's if it's not worth measuring then why was it worth doing anything in the first place? If that's low hanging fruit let that go. Yeah. There's bigger fish to fry elsewhere in the uh, modern enterprise. Well thank you for those terms. I'm going to pull you back to the, back to the big picture of the video series and ask you what discoveries have you made or what unexpected consequences have occurred from going through this process for you? Um, several things. I, I've got to connect on more of a personal level with some of the gurus in the field mm -hmm. because I've spent now time with them, interviewing them and getting to know them and that kind of establishes a bond. Some of these people I've known for 20, 30 years, but then sitting down and doing this and the, you know, before we hit the record button, we chat, mm -hmm. and then after we hit the, you know, end the recording, then we chat, and so that's been kind of good and interesting. Um, and the same way with newer people that aren't part of the guru crowd, there are the up-and-coming, I think, people to mm -hmm. a large extent. <coughs> I had somebody say the other day that Oh, I'm not worthy to be part of this. And no, you're part of the diversity of HPT practitioners. Not everybody is a guru. Not everybody has a name, uh, um, being a musician's musician, with your, uh, uh, to use that analogy. But um, so there, I've gotten people who work in uh, nuclear power plants, and they have a different concern about human performance. And pure human performance is where we don't blow up this part of Canada <laughs> yeah. and blow it off the face of the world. You know, so so consequence systems are very different. And so I've gone after people who, because of their context, their performance context, has huge 
consequences and I wanted to find out do they approach this whole thing about learning and development a little bit differently? You know, are they measuring butts in seats and butts on sites, or are they doing, you know, worthy measurement of business results, like safety incidences and things like that? Um, so the so one of the consequences here is I've been exposed now to people um, that do are involved in other aspects of instructional design, maybe more technically oriented with a lot of the new tools and etc. Um, or they're in a totally different lane, the total quality management movement lane, yeah. um, or people that are working on motivational kinds of systems and, and that kind of thinking. So it's been a great exposure for me. Um, and it kind of lines up with one of my thoughts was that when I first entered the business in 1979 and I'd go to my local NSPI chapter meeting and get 90 minutes from somebody, it was always good stuff. And I, it's harder to do nowadays and people are so dispersed. So for the people who don't have a local chapter of any kind of professional group that they can go to and get stimulated and begin to think and think about uh, applying some things. So maybe this points people to something like that. Um, and if you know, the more people that know about how to improve performance deliberately <laughs> by design uh, and kind of know what you're doing so that you can do it again in maybe the, a similar context or in a different context, uh, that's where I think uh, that's what energizes me about the whole field is that it's all been all about that. Would you talk about high-risk professions like nuclear power plants? I would include doc medical doctors and with with those fields and the people you interview that work in them, do you find that they run across the same types of problems as say uh, someone in retail or in um, technology or um, in the other field? I, I, th I think so. I, so I, I think there's some things that, you know, generalize takeaways from uh, a lot of the work that I do. So when I'm looking at, when I'm doing my instructional design kind of work, I'm generally going to build a curriculum architecture, which is mm -hmm. basically for one or multiple jobs, First of all, what's the performance? What do they do? What are the tasks and outputs produced, blah, blah, blah. And then deriving what are the enabling knowledge and skills. Um, and so part of when we're capturing the performance, the ideal performance, we do a gap analysis on the same page. So we can identify what are the outputs and the key measures. So how do you tell a good one from a bad one? Mm -hmm. And what are the tasks for that output? So we've got this, what I call an output task cluster of data. Output, measure, and then the tasks associated with that, and then the roles and responsibilities, who's doing what, and then that's ideal performance. When master performers talk about it, they go, yeah, I do something very similar to that. I change it a little bit each time, but basically that's what you do. And you can ask them, so now what, what are the gaps? What are the people who aren't master performers? How do they go about doing this work that we just wrote down and pinned down? And they can say, I, I always start with, well, here are the outputs, and here are the key measures that you guys said were the key measures. Mm -hmm. So what measures do, do the non-master performers, which measures do they typically blow? So we start with the output in mind, the end in mind, and what measures are not being met. And then therefore we can talk about, oh, so that it's late. It's always late. It's never on time. The whole thing was it's got to be on time and non-master performers are always late. So why are they late? So what's the probable gap cause? Mm. Now, I can't do root cause analysis and ask why five times on all of these things here. I've got to quickly get off the top of the heads of the people that I'm working with. Why? Why is that a problem? And they'll give me three or four or five different reasons, and then we can look at those reasons and say, you know, which of these are attributed to the person's the that individual's knowledge and skills? Is are they are they failing because they don't know any better, or no? The data is they're late because the data that they're waiting on is late to them. Mm -hmm. So what are they going to do? So you can't train them. You can't train that away. The problem lies elsewhere. And so this kind of data then helps clients begin to think about broader than training. You got some fixes you got to make so that. But new hires wouldn't know how to do those tasks. Uh, 
Yep. So you have a need for training for new hires, but if you're trying to solve a performance problem, um, uh, I'd like to say that uh, training requests for new hires should be expected, and training requests for problem solving should be suspected because uh-huh. most likely training isn't going to, you know, resolve the problem. And and I use the term training meaning a whole bunch of things, and I'd actually rather use the word instruction because. Good training is instructional, mm. and good education is instructional, but job aids and performance support, they better be instructional, otherwise they're not worth the paper that they're printed on or the electrons that they're you know showing up on your screen. Um, so we so instruction to me is a, a, now a better umbrella term for that intervention set because it can be more all uh, um, inclusive of the things that uh, that we produce, we engineer or architect, and uh, to help people do their jobs, whether that's training before they have a need or performance support so they can use that in the workflow. If I can borrow a few new uh, buzz phrase terms. <laughs> and yes, you can. <laughs> before we conclude, and we're just about done, what else do you want our audience to know about your HPT video series? Well, that um, I hope to expand it um, and capture people from other countries and cultures um, to have a better appreciation of some of the language similarities and differences that we have as we discuss this. So I've been, I've done uh, several videos here just in the last several weeks here a couple in canada a couple in england one in ireland um i have been trying to arrange ones for some people in australia but um so the people that are instructional systems designers or instructional designers that aspire to have more performance impact uh, who hope to ha- have more performance-based instruction as part of what they produce and to be able to recognize when instruction of any type is not going to solve the problem. Um, so when we're in there doing our upfront analysis and throughout the project, because you're doing analysis in every phase in design and development as well, but what if you know what you're looking for, if you can find the other gaps so that you can help your client because they want performance they want Mm -hmm. to sustain uh, the performance as it is and not have it deteriorate and or they want to improve it um, drastically or incrementally but but so we are um, Challenged in, in doing all of that, um, I've lost my place here with, with the question again. Yes, yeah, so what, <laughs> it, it, we, we started off with, what do you want your audience to know about the HPT video series? Yeah, so that, so, so that I hope that there's an appreciation of that it is diverse, that it's okay to come into the field and not have a degree in instructional design, a master's mm. degree or a PhD to start with. There's a lot of people who are what Cami Bean uh, famously uh, 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 be- became known as uh, accidental uh, trainers, yeah. accidental designers. And um, a lot of people backed into this and have brought something to the practice of instructional design, the practice of performance improvement because of their varied interests and background. Um, so I'm just hoping to capture more of that, more diversity of people that are doing interesting things. Now, it, it's hard for me to screen people to know that are they truly evidence-based or mm. evidence-informed or research-based or research-informed. Sometimes they're just doing stuff that seems to work and there's no research one way or another. So part of my challenge is to explore the edges uh, without getting into the snake oil and foo foo uh, and all yeah. of that. So um, I want to be open to those kinds of things, but I want to, um, but I don't want to inadvertently have shared 
some snake oil simply because I was myself not aware that it was snake oil. Well, I appreciate you spending time sharing with us the behind the scenes look into the HPT video series and sharing more about yourself. Thank you for the service to HPT professional community and I believe we are done. So thanks again. Thank you, Gary.